Next, we turn our attention, our attention to the first of four panel discussions titled Designing Our Way Out of the Energy Crisis. Let me try that again. It's actually Designing Our Way Out of the Energy Crisis. <laughs> no, that, there's a question mark at the end of that title. With us to explore that important question is our chair Sunan Prasad and our panelist Will Ephraim John Quill. <laughs> Will Ephraim, John, John Quill Hackenberg, and Claire Rowland. Sanand, over to you. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, a big welcome. Very excited to be here with three amazing speakers who are going to tell us exactly how we design our way out of the energy crisis. Um, and uh, without a question mark, hopefully. Um, now, uh, the, the format here is that I, do you, I believe that you are all going to put up an image, is that right? And then speak to that image or is that actually uh, not happening anymore? Okay. Um, you see, we're, we're slightly on the fly because we're going to be obviously in person in Newcastle and uh, we, are, we are having to make things up a bit uh, as we go along. Um, but um, what I'm going to just ask people to do is, uh, just say a piece about their view of designing their way out of the energy crisis. Uh, and I'm saying that now because I'm gonna speak for a few minutes while they get their thoughts together. And um, I'm gonna ask John Quill Hackenberg first, who is the Global Head of Sustainability and Climate Resilience at PA Consult. And am I right, John Quill, that you have, uh, you're also on the Design Council trustee board? And you've just joined, so congratulations for that. That's very lovely. Um, Will Frame is of Elik, and he's helping energy companies to engage with customers. Will, you can say more about yourself when your turn comes. I'm keeping it short for now. Sure. And Claire Rowland is product management. Uh, it is engaged in project management, product management, and design for the Internet of Things and clean energy, and has many wider engagements with with the whole issue of how we use energy more smartly and more effectively and she will talk about that. But let me just start by, by just noting that abundant energy, uh, apparently free energy, at least so cheap as to be nearly free, is the reason why we're all here and it's the reason why we're connecting on the internet and the reason we have the grid and it's something that we've, we're actually hooked on, uh, that the Earth civilization is hooked on this extraordinary supply of energy. And of course, the irony underneath it is that we do have abundant energy because all energy is ultimately from the sun. And uh, as many of you will have heard, that actually, even if we captured 100 of the sun's energy falling on the Earth or some figure like that, can't be exactly right we have enough to power our entire, all our, all our processes and, and everything. But of course, that's not an easily done thing. And we've relied on the stored up energy and we, we are using it up. And the energy crisis first uh, came to light, not really as an issue about carbon or atmospheric limits or any of the other environmental limits, but actually about the stuff running out, about the end of resources. And the Club of Rome report in 1971, the OPEC energy crisis that immediately followed in 73, were the kind of seismic events, which happened exactly to parallel my, my time as, a, as an adult and from my earliest days in School of Architecture to, to now, over 50 years. And that, uh, that, that is almost kind of, kind of I've, 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 my parents, in a way, were brought up with this, although they actually lived in a very low energy place, they're brought up with the idea that energy wasn't an issue to energy increasingly becoming an issue and also the cause of global conflict, uh, the determinant, uh, the hidden hand in a way of so much of what goes on in the world and how, how governments behave. Um, the photovoltaic effect is getting on for 180 years uh, old since it was first discovered. 1839 was when the PV effect was discovered. In 1887, we had the first electricity generating windmill. 
And these are, of course, all extraordinary design interventions. And that's why I mentioned them, because it was design which, which got us all that uh, amazing amount of energy, although the, the, neither the PV, uh, in fact, nor the generating of electricity from windmills really got going. So, as you all know, we, you know, within most of our lifetimes to any real significant uh, extent. And partly, of course, because there was this stuff to be dug out of the ground. It wasn't that, you know, there was any lack of ingenuity or innovation. It could have happened that we took that path all that time ago. There was enough, uh, enough imagination and intelligence, but because there was this stuff to be dug out of ground, we, we didn't do that. The national grid uh, is actually barely 80 years old. It's 1935 is when we had the national grid. And when I was at school, we went to visit the local gas plant in Edmonton at a time when 90% of gas came from coal. So coal was dug up, turned into gas, and then pumped into people's homes. So there's been a long journey of invention and industry uh, in, in this field. And it's since the, uh, since the Club of Rome report, Limits to Growth, since the OPEC oil crisis, then of course 1980s, uh, and uh, the Brompton report in and the Rio conference, and the increasing awareness of of uh, what was then just called global warming, now we call the climate emergency, quite rightly, have moved the issue of how we use energy to the very top. And uh, uh, my 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 question to everyone is actually pretty much the same. Uh, it's, it's there in the title, but but in a way more than that, it is um, how how do we contextualize the whole of this scene? What exactly is the energy crisis? Uh, how do we define, you know, do, do we really understand what the energy crisis is? And how might we navigate our way out of it? And that's the, the big picture. And then of course, within that, what is the role of design? Obviously, high gas prices make up much of the current public perception of the crisis, but they hardly touch the big issues because cheap energy from coal, oil and gas is responsible for our living standards, as I've said, not only of the West and, not, and even then not for everyone, but for much of the rest of the world. And of course, again, for relatively few. Fossil-based energy has been a giant hidden hand, as I say, in global politics and some of its most destructive manifestations. So what is a place of design in all that? I'd be very interested in identifying the obstacles to doing what needs to be done, which is what needs to be done is very widely agreed and it's based on sound science. I would also be interested, and I'm sure they'll be very much forthcoming, on the most exciting and emergent ideas that, um, that, that will help us navigate our way out of this crisis. So if John Quill, you're happy to do so, can I turn to you first? And we'll follow up with, uh, with Will and then Claire, if that's okay by you all. So John Quill, could you give us a few minutes of reflection? And can I suggest that we go around, have those reflections, maybe a, a brief to and fro, and then in the second half of our time together, we will uh, we will we'll just have a more of a, a general chat. John Quill. I think you're on mute still. Can everybody else hear John Quill? No. No, can you hear me? Yes. Um, do you want me to take that first while John Cole will try and get the, the uh, yeah, cool. Um, so I've not well necessarily written, <laughs> written down the thoughts, but um, just from a leak point of view, uh, so I've worked in the energy industry for a long time, so I'm probably going to be slightly skewed uh, towards um, energy and particularly energy in the home. So a leak, we help um, anyone that wants to uh, offer a digital product to a customer um, better bring energy to life. So typically that has been uh, energy retailers and utilities across multiple markets um, but that's now more increasingly going into different spaces so we have banks as clients we have 
um, kind of smart home providers, people that have uh, energy technology in someone's home as clients as well. And I think um, there's a, we've got here ultimately, as you've pointed out, that the industrial revolution is the reason we're here, the reason we have a standard of living, the reason we're speaking on Zoom now. Uh, and that can't be forgotten, but I think we feel like we've got to almost a tipping point. And um, if I take it from a home owner's perspective or people that live in, in, in homes in the Europe and wider, then ultimately this was always coming. Um, that abundance of very cheap gas, uh, as an example, um, was always going to end at some point. And the scarcity of uh, supply that's been impacted by what's going on in Ukraine and, and Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine has had that kind of catalyst of an effect. Uh, and I think this is probably a bit cliche to say it's an opportunity, but I really do believe it is because conversations that I'm having with, well, our researchers are having with customers, with different um, types of organizations, this is the opportunity to get things right um, and using that catalyst around actually people are caring about energy because I've had people before going, well, my energy bill's not that much. I don't pay that much per month. If I save a few percent, it doesn't make any difference. Well, now like a five or ten percent saving is actually quite a large, um, large part of what someone will be spending. So if you can take actions to drive that, um, even without any optimization or doing other things within the home, then actually that can be the catalyst to get people to um, start or well, start and then continue to take action on how they manage and use energy in the home. And I think as a starting point, it is around that kind of understanding, but then you want them to start to take action. And then ultimately you want them to get to, um, to having like solar panels, as you mentioned, solar voltaics as an example, I didn't realize they were that old. Um, but um, how do you get more and more people to participate in the energy transition? And I feel, or the home energy transition. So um, I think the image I was gonna show was kind of the classic um, like product adoption curve, like crossing the chasm, I feel, there's a lot of technology we have out there right now um, and it's currently more for those able to pay generally. So someone that might have a Tesla has uh, like a battery, uh, has PV mm -hmm. systems. And obviously that's good because it proves the technology works and helps get costs down. But I think the real uh, opportunity and challenge both for design uh, and design is meant in different contexts. I'll come to that in a second. Is how do we get more people from the early side of the product adoption curve into kind of the majority. And that's not just going to be with the technology because one of the big barriers is um, like how, how, how do you pay for it? So if I give an analogy, if you look at trying to buy a house in London and you're renting, well, you're probably already paying enough to pay the mortgage. You just can't afford the deposit. <laughs> um, and it's kind of similar with actually, I could afford solar PV, um, if I was paying the amount per month and the savings help outweigh it, but I can't actually afford or get access easily to the cost of the system. So that's like 10 grand, 15 grand. Um, so how do we bring different elements together? So we're designing A, for customers to engage and start to take action, but also thinking about how do we bring other elements in um, from other industries and other spaces to, I guess, design the path from um, my energy bill is really high. I don't know what's going on to actually I've got um, PV on my roof, um, my next car is going to be electric or I'm car sharing. How do we get more people to that space? And I think that's where the real opportunity is and but it needs to be designing for the future, not just for the crisis right now. Because a lot of what's going on is, oh, we can do something in the short term. But if you just do the short term, you need to be thinking with the long term in mind as well, because you have this one opportunity or to get people to, um, to hook in. And we had a, a session with one of our clients where uh, one of their execs basically said, if if you're not helping your customers this winter, someone else will be. So there's a lot of people looking to try and help, but it's how do you take that beyond that um, initial stage? So um, yeah, that's as a starting point in my um, high level view. Happy to go more detail as we go. So you've posed the question beautifully, Will, how do you go from one side of the uh, production curve to the implementation side? And I love your analogy with the mortgages. That's exactly, uh, that chimes very well. But presumably, the next time we hear you talk, we'll hear some of the solutions to how we do Poss that. Po okay, possibly. so you, you've set up the, the suspense perfectly. Um, John Quill, do you want to try to see if we can hear you? Yeah, can you hear me now? Yay. Okay. Yes, we can. Yes. 
Fabulous. Um, so no, great setup and well, thank you for stepping in. Um, I fully agree with you uh, around trying to understand, so getting a greater understanding of what we're actually trying to solve for. It seems like such a a monster challenge that that people don't really know how to participate or do anything about it. I also fully agree that this is, we've now got a crisis that is that everybody is feeling because of the Ukraine war. Um, whereas cl climate crisis in general wasn't near enough for people to touch and feel or be impacted by until this point. And that sense of crisis allows us to then move forward in a much more collective manner. I think that the challenge that I see is that we're used to fossil fuels full stop. And so everybody's looking for a silver bullet of one solution. And, and the challenge and therefore opportunity is we aren't going to solve and replace fossil fuels with one just one solution. It's not going to be just PV. It's not going to be just solar thermal. Um, it's not going to be just wind. It's not going to be just hydrogen. It's going to be a combination of all of these things and, and many, many more. And so understanding understanding both the generation of electricity, so the, the green electrons, as well as the distribution, is, is the big thing that we need to start thinking about in a much more collective fashion. Um, I think in design, the role of design is really thinking about the end user and business or end household or end community or city in mind, because that interaction between generation and distribution is going to be absolutely critical how we how we marry those two things together. And I also think um, as we're moving forward in, in, in designing all of this, it's, it's really looking at both how do we reduce the amount of energy that we need and have and, and be much more um, efficient in the energy that we use, as well as how do we replace it with green electrons. Um, perhaps the, the final bit as the starting point from my side is really our ability to scale up innovation. So I would argue we have an awful lot of innovation in this space. We, we have so many amazing innovators out there designing new solutions, designing parts of products. Where we need to get to very, very quickly if we're going to have impact at scale is connecting those innovators together across an entire value chain, whether that's a value chain of hydrogen, whether that's a value chain of carbon capture and storage, and scaling all of those components up across the value chain um, to industrial levels so we can have impact at scale, which in turn will scale up the financing that's required in support of these projects. What we have at the moment is lots of innovation and lots of many bits and everyone feeling like they're doing the right thing and doing good for society but actually we now need impact and we need it fast thank you very much um and i think that the point you made about generation and distribution is a perfect segue hopefully for claire Right. Can you can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Thank you, Claire. Yes, we can hear you. Lovely. Fantastic. I had an internet message about five minutes before twelve o'clock, so I'm I'm on five G. Let's hope it holds up. Um, I am actually going to attempt to share my screen because I've got the image here that I had. Um, I've got the image here that I, that I that I was going to share. Um, and it's not the exciting vision of the future that I was originally asked for. It's a it's a it's a it's a slightly dull looking graph. But let me let me explain why I'm doing that. Um, so I think in terms of the crisis, I mean, as others have said, we are thinking about this in terms of in terms of cost, but it's not just about cost. It's about decarbonisation. That's there's an existential crisis here, um, which is you know which is which is a, a bigger and longer term thing than you know than than than, than current level of gas prices. Um, but you know, renewable energy is cheap, as we've said. It shouldn't. Why is energy expensive for us? It shouldn't be. We need the right policies. We need the right technology. We need the capabilities to make better use of it. Um, so using it more efficiently is important, but it's not the only factor. Um, and I'm going to talk about how you know our main route is to shift as much of our energy consumption to electricity as possible, because once something is electrified, it can run on zero carbon energy. Um, but one of the challenges there is that we don't always have renewable energy when we actually want to use it. So what this graph is showing uh, is basically, and this is this is a few years old now, but the patterns are the patterns are similar. Uh, as basically the times of day. So this is like, these are 24 hours, if you can see my cursor, but these little wavy blue lines, this is 24 hour periods 
Um, and there's what you get in, in the course of 24 hours is a, is a peak in the morning. People get up and start using, uh, you know, start cooking breakfast and, and that sort of thing. Uh, and a bigger peak in the evening, particularly in winter, much bigger peak when people are using heating, they, they're, they're cooking dinner, they're doing, they're using appliances. There's, there's much more going on. But that doesn't marry up necessarily with when the sun is shining uh, and when the wind and when the wind is blowing. Uh, so wind and solar don't necessarily give us lots of energy at peak times, particularly evening winters when everybody wants to use it. And sometimes they also generate more than we need, um, but then people aren't using it. So this this kind of these orange areas, that's the gap between um, that's that's when we have shortfall. People are trying to use more than we actually have. Uh, and the and the, the, the yellow areas here, this is what we call curtailment. This is when there's too much generation going into the grid and people actually get paid to do things like switch off wind turbines and switch off solar generation. This is nuts. We don't have enough energy at certain times. When we don't have enough, we currently rely on gas to make up that shortfall. At other times, we're switching it off. We need to stop doing this. And this variation is going to get worse. We're going to see we see bigger and bigger peaks in the winter evenings as more we switch more and more of our heating over to to electric like heat pumps. Um, and that's the worst time of day because there's there's no solar, right? Um, so what can we do about that? Well, we can do a few different things. We can encourage people who consume energy to spread that demand around. Uh, maybe running heat pumps, charging cars when electricity is low carbon plentiful. We also need storage. We need places to put that energy when we're generating it. We've got too much, uh, both at the grid scale. So huge batteries on the grid, making hydrogen out of seawater. That's good. And also in homes. So home batteries, EV batteries, hot water tanks, all really good ways to store energy so people can make use of energy that was generated at a different time. And the benefit of doing this basically is we can avoid having to spend so much money on the energy system. UK government smart systems and flexibility plan estimates that we can spend 10 billion a year on electricity, save 10 billion a year on electricity system costs by 2050. If we have lots of flexibility in the system, that means lots of shifting things around, lots of storage, trying to trying to even out these, these curves than if we don't do that. And if we don't do that, it's going to be really difficult and expensive to decarbonize the energy system. Um, and the levers we've got for doing that, having the tech in homes, pricing, policy, we're going to have to get smarter about those incentives. Um, I work for the um, currently working with the Energy Systems Catapults Living Lab. Uh, we have 1500 homes of varying degrees of, of low carbon technologies, which we can monitor and control. We're already starting to see demand peaks in the middle of the night when EV owners are, are charging. So it's all right. You know, currently we have uh, tariffs that, that make it cheaper for people to charge EVs in the middle of the night. The more and more people have EVs. The more the more that becomes a problem so we need to get a lot smarter about it it's not just about making electricity cheap at, at, at 4 a.m uh, we have to be these things actually have to coordinate with each other we have to have much more dynamic kind of kind of incentives um so so what can designers I want to talk a bit about what can designers do about this and my my take on this is you know i'm very much focused on on consumers uh, you know as as, as john Cole and, and, and will are um and i think that's where designers can you know where designers can have, can have a big impact Two things. First of all, this is a massive mindset shift for consumers. We've historically all thought about energy as like water. It's just there when you need it. We've not had to think in terms of balance and scarcity beforehand, at least not in the UK. There are other countries in the world where people are very, very aware of things like load shedding. It's, 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 it's a huge problem. But right here, but here we've not had to worry about this. And if we don't get that balance right, we create problems. One of those is loss of agency. Uh, there was a case recently in Colorado of some air conditioning thermostats that were all shutting off during a heat wave to save excess demand on the local power network. Turned out those consumers had actually opted into that. They didn't really understand quite what they what they'd signed up for. So there's this, you know, everyone's freaking out. This is like you've taken control away from me. I'm, I'm, I'm not getting my device. system's not working at the very top point. I most need it. And um, the second thing is fairness and vulnerability. So not everyone can afford the latest technology. Not everyone can even afford energy right now. Um, not everyone can shift their consumption around to save a few quid. So just making peak time electricity expensive has consequences for them. You know, we can't be penalising people who, you know, on low incomes for cooking the kids dinner at 5 p.m. They can't do that at 4 a.m. It's not fair. Um, and some people need protection much, much more than others. So some people really, really need to stay warm. They can't just choose to take turn heating off and put a jumper on. They have medical conditions. They may, you know, there, there could be serious consequences from doing that. Um, and also, you know, when you might be running a medical device like a ventilator at home, you know, it's, it's, you can't risk a blackout. So the right solutions allow people to to live their lives um, and not suffer. And, you know, the thing, I, I, you know, we, we need to think about consumers in all of this, but also there is a responsibility on the system here. You know, we have to we can't simply say this is about 
you know, using less, at, using less at home. We have to design a system that delivers that fairness for everybody. And I think that's where you know, designers really have a huge role to play. Thank you very much. Claire, if we did, if we perfectly managed supply and demand on the grid and had a smart grid completely throughout, if you if you say if we've got uh, you know a hundred miles to go, how much of that do you think is achieved simply by Internet of Things uh, connected uh, equipment, smart technologies? Do you have do you have a, a, an idea of the scale of what we can we can do? So, yes, very hard to put a, hard to put a number on that. Um, I think the there's. I mean, it, it, the IoT, the, the kind of connected technologies. So this this happens at all different levels. So this happens, you know, there are devices in homes. Um, so, you know, heat pumps that can shift their consumption around. We've already got like, many many people are using smart EV charging, which shifts their EV charging around. It doesn't really matter when you get that. When you it's like if you've got a full battery in the morning, it doesn't really matter whether that happens at seven pm or four am for most people. Um, so there's the in home technology, then. Having all those individual to, uh, individual devices, you've also got sort of emerging area of energy, home energy management technology. So this is another layer that sits on top of that, might coordinate those devices in your home when you've got multiples. And then you've got the much bigger thing, which is which is basically enabling the smart grid. So you've got devices, you know, you've got you've got um, connected connected things and much much smarter monitoring that's happening across the grid as a whole that's enabling much better much much better management of it. I don't have numbers in terms of in, in terms of how much we need to, to, to spend on that, but the headline figure I referenced earlier, you know, it's that it's that 10 billion of system operating costs per year that we save us. I think that the, the number between now and 2050 is about somewhere between about an estimated 30 to 70 billion pounds uh, of additional system costs to try to provide additional generation and additional technology to upgrade and balance the grid that we will need by 2050. To be a, if we if we if we don't then if, if if we're not smarter about when we use energy. Fantastic, Will. I remember you uh, saying something about the uh, there. There's now a new peak at two a.m. because of electricity vehicle charging. Uh, I think I think that was the Claire uh, from the Living Lab for, for, from uh -huh. Energy Systems Catapult. But I think there's a a really good point that Claire just made. Well, a little bit earlier was around the Colorado example. Um, I think there's something around transparency um, and how do you get customers to understand what this may mean and what changes are. And I think that's something that's very hard to do um, to some extent, because typically the companies where um, if I, I, I expect in Colorado, it's probably the utility doing it. Um, what's the level of trust that they have in being able to do things within the customer's homes? Um, and if you look at utilities uh, in general, they're not usually that trusted in terms of uh, organizations on probably most of the most of the charts where they kind of measure that. Um, and if you want to be able to then control things in people's homes off the back of signals um, that, that's automated versus kind of opt in or, or like behavioral, then you have to bring the customers along on that journey and people might be on different stages. And I think, again, that's where probably design comes in. I don't know, Claire, what's your thoughts around uh transparency and getting people to understand what they're signing up for absolutely it's absolutely critical and i think this is you know the, the colorado example i was talking about that was on my um and just some passport colleagues you know what the distribution networks that's the people who who get the energy who get the electricity from you know basically from the substation to your to your home from the from the pylons kind of to your home what they really want for something like that is the ability to to turn things off when there's when there's a massive demand spike um that doesn't match up with what consumers want which is i really want my air conditioning at the absolutely <laughs> hottest times of day or you know in the uk it's more likely to be you know when i read the times i most want my heating is going to be when it's the coldest and that's when there's going to be the most demand and because we don't have that experience most of us don't have that experience of, of scarcity of electricity we just don't understand what it takes to get this to our door so it's a very different conversation that we're trying to open up with 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 consumers around you know, the system might, might not always be able to provide all of the things you want. So we, we might need to shift things around a little bit. But I think it's 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 partly about that transparency of understanding and you know, having an honest conversation with people, 
partly about ensuring that certain basic needs are always met, particularly for the most vulnerable. Um, it's about identifying the things that, that, you know, people are happy to kind of shift a bit. And it's about having the technology that allows us to, to shift it around without really suffering for it. So, you know, there are ways of tweaking heat pumps a little bit so that they, they, they warm up a little bit earlier and don't really cool down. You can, you can, you can maybe reduce the power consumption a bit. If you're smart in the way, in, in the way that you, in the ways that you do those things, people don't really have to suffer quite as much as just kind of, you know, bluntly shutting everything off. <laughs> so John, John Crowley, you made the very uh, good point that there isn't a silver bullet. There's no single action. Actually, there are many actions and perhaps demand management is one of those, which in the scheme of things has a relatively small impact, but I don't know quite what that impact is, whether you know, it's a, it's significant if it's 10% of the whole lot, maybe it is as much as that. But nevertheless, obviously, it's not enough by itself. And you mentioned in particular, you mentioned hydrogen, but as well, uh, and you also mentioned carbon capture and storage, which suggests that you think that actually we're not going to become free of fossil fuels, but we are going to have to burn fossil fuels, but manage the carbon that comes out of them and capture it and, and, and store it away. Could you say a bit more about where you see uh, our future energy coming from? Yeah, sure. So, so I think I mean I think there's a there's a reality check around the fact that we're we're not suddenly going to get to net zero by tomorrow, and so um, and, and part of the problem in that is people actually even understanding what net zero means versus carbon neutral and climate positive and all these other terms that are being bandished around. Um, so, so I think the reality is, is that anyway, net zero, so balancing out that which we emit with that which we um, uh, don't emit is not good enough. We have too much carbon in the air at the moment. And so that means we need technologies to remove that carbon. And like tree planting is a great solution but it's not we don't have enough space we don't have enough time for to wait for trees to grow to be effective to capture carbon we need new technology such as direct air capture such as biochar such as advanced rock weathering that that can remove this carbon right. so, well. so just just for clarity you uh, you're not specifically saying carbon capture and storage in order to continue burning fossil fuels you're talking more about direct air capture and uh, and concrete rock to remove carbon from the air. Just because you, you mentioned the yeah. that in the context of innovation and the value chain, the ones that we need to encourage and put together. So it, that's really about removing the carbon that's already in the air. Uh, but specifically about, you know, many people are arguing, and it's, they've, they've been doing so for a very long time, that actually we're never going to get to uh, you know, sufficient renewable based gr green energy, you know, whether it's tide, air, sun or, uh, or, or something else, um, that we are going to have to go on burning fossil fuels and that at the very least, and of course I should have mentioned nuclear as well in there, mm -hmm. the, um, the, at the very least, the transition will require us to go on burning fossil fuels and capture, air, capture energy, ca capture the carbon dioxide that arises from it. Just, just a, a thought on it, you know, what, because actually one of the, you know, the, one of the problems with transitional technologies is that they don't, they don't, they're not transitional, they, they become embedded and then, you know, we create a new headache. So, so moving, we, we have to wean ourselves off fossil fuels, that, that's, I think that's non-debatable, but it will take time. We need critical infrastructure to keep on running in that period and so we can't just suddenly you know with all the load balancing that Claire talks about we can't we can't just switch that overnight the point is technologies like hydrogen isn't just using fossil fuels per se there's lots of different colors of hydrogen there's also turquoise hydrogen for example um, or, or there's pink hydrogen which is based upon nuclear and so those different technologies allow us to uh, uh, but whilst you know and blue hydrogen which we have to have in the interim allows us to continue using gas which is not burning so much but is allowing us to learn how we distribute hydrogen faster and further so i think the the point the point i was trying to make is that there isn't one solution and 
we need to be exploring all of these things in parallel because there just simply isn't enough land mass to have just PV or just wind farms. And we also don't have the geographical conditions in every single country to, to do that. But, but I think all of these things put together are absolutely critical landscape of the future. Do you think that there is sufficient, uh, do we have, you know, are people generating the numbers? Do we understand the numbers sufficiently to know where to direct our effort to best effect? I, pretty sure we don't and I think so Bill Gates has written a brilliant book how to mm. how to avoid yeah that's lovely it's beautifully full of numbers it, you know, it's wonderfully beautiful it's no, no full of numbers yeah it's really accessible and the way he talks about the 51 billion which is the number that we all need to contribute to it's like how are we chipping away that 51 yeah. billion we need to remove yeah. I think is the goal that we all need to focus on rather than worrying about these small micro things very good Will, so now um, you, you set it up beautifully, um, and I think one of the things that I got from what, what you've been saying is that you, you the, the high prices can trigger that first step that people take, the first action that people take in their own lives to, uh, as consumers to reduce energy use and to be more aware of it. Um, and I, I was quite struck by, by that notion that actually that first step is very important. Um, it's the first step which is now made possible by what we are now locally calling the energy crisis, which is you know, of course not the main energy crisis, but it's our immediate energy crisis. How, how, do, you then, how do you catalyze that for, for further action on it? And how do you solve the problem of the, of the mortgage and the, and the deposit? Yeah, uh, great question. I guess the, the the starting point is that some people would be engaged with their energy before and doing things already. Um, they probably are more aware. Um, we've done some experiments in terms of just language used in terms of messaging. Uh, and if you, uh, with one client, uh, we, for example, went with uh, just a basically you know, save the planet carbon message, uh, nothing on cost, pretty low response. And if you, uh, I can't remember the stats off the top of my head, but then running the same message, matching carbon and cost, um, much higher response. So I think the two are quite linked right now for probably most people. Um, and I think it's giving them ways to be able to do something about it, not just saying your bill's high, well, what can you do to reduce it? Um, you know, social comparisons and social norms are always really powerful. Um, so as humans, um, we're innately <laughs> comparing ourselves to one another. Um, if you compare what you're doing in your home and how you're managing energy in the home versus a peer group that's similar to you, um, that's always been shown to have very positive uh, impact in terms of getting people to take action. Um, so I guess the, the first point of your question is really, well, now people can start to do things and you've got to give them things that help them understand it, not just here's a usage graph and it shows um, some cost and well, what can you do with that? Like, how do you make that actionable for more people? Um, so some of the things that we do is kind of break that into different categories and appliances so you can see what that is. But ultimately, it's around how can you make really good recommendations? So let's think about, um, so some people may have views on how good the, the relevance uh, algorithms are, say, at Netflix and Spotify. But ultimately, they're presenting, it, it's using machine learning to present things that make sense for you. So imagine if you shifted that into energy and you go, actually, for your home, these are the top three things that would make sense for you based upon how you use energy compared to others and where you spend the most on that. And then if you imagine, let's say there's a saving, you present a saving of uh, 200 pounds per year uh, and you can match that with finance where the cost of the finance for that saving is less than 200 pounds per year, you suddenly remove that upfront barrier so I, I think we feel as, as a leak and, and, and the work that we've been doing that actually that's that's where the big opportunity is to get more people to get to the state where they can have devices in the home that can contribute to flexibility mm. is how can you get more people there? And I think it's, it's that, so that mortgage analogy is using like, like finance, uh, open finance data to be able to better understand what someone can or can't afford and matching that with um, energy recommendations that are actually tailored to the individual versus the energy efficiency advice every energy supplier in the UK and other markets has been giving for the past 10-15 years which 
Um, it's just general, here's 10 bits of advice to save energy, but there's no context of how much useful to you or what you're already doing. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, is, is there a sense, uh, as as the there's, I think, a, a, a comment or question from the audience, that whilst we do things in our personal lives, and we might do more to make significant change, but actually it feels like there's a constant battle against big corporations cancelling out anything that the public can do because the scales are so different perhaps presumably because they can so you know with relatively small actions from big corporations have big impact does that ring a bell at all uh, is there um, is there a hard line uh, thing uh, I, yeah I, I guess if i answer that from 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 my view obviously um large corporations doing things and actually meaning that they're doing it, it and actually doing something meaningful versus just greenwashing is important but i think as an individual if everyone takes the attitude of someone else will sort it out, mm. then it won't happen. Um, so therefore, those listening today start to think about actions you can take on what you're doing from an energy saving point of view, as an example, and try and lead by example. Um, and then I think as Claire's point earlier as well as around, it's not just the individuals, it's not just homeowners, um, design is around the design of the system, it's policy, it's incentives. Uh, if I give an example, I, the house I moved into had solar PV on the roof, um, but it wasn't the PV where the previous uh, occupant had bought it. It was the free PV when the feed-in tariff was at an opportune rate in the UK, where actually you reduced the barrier for having PV on the roof. You just got the benefit of the free electricity during the day. So there are ways to means to do that have happened before. If I give that as an example, that is... Admittedly, I don't think it was thought through government policy, which is happy to explain on that if anyone had any questions afterwards, because they, they ran out of budget quite quickly. Um, but ultimately, it was a way to get energy technology into someone's home um, without an upfront barrier, and that worked really well. Um, and that was that kind of mix of some policy on a feeding tariff um, with some um, innovation in terms of financing, like how could you do that? Uh, I think the rate of return at one point was about 15%. Um, so then you've got pension funds willing to invest in it because it was government back for 25 years, right? So that's a great example of matching innovation, not just in the technology, the solar panels, but actually how you matched other things to it, such as finance and driven by um, government policy. So the, probably not the best example, given what happened with the, the crash it's of the market. But... <laughs> uh, yeah. I was going to say, if I, if I might add to that as well, just to, yeah. to build off some of the things Will's talking about, there's also innovation in business models, and we see this with the, 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 kind of the, the people who come through the, the catapult for, for support, um, and, and some of the work, some of the work that, we, that we've also been doing around, you know, things like energy as a service, or things like heat as a service. So instead of paying up front for a piece of technology which you hope is going to deliver some, some, some energy saving, there are alternative ways to make that stuff available to consumers. So they might be paying for an outcome. Perhaps they don't really own the heating technology in their home, um, but they're paying to be to be at a certain level of comfort. The Catapult did, did a bunch of trials around this a few years ago, but you also see this with, um, you know, you, you could see this with you know, perhaps somebody's funding you to put a heat pump in the home or funding you to funding you for EV charging, but they're deriving some benefit or a battery. They're deriving some benefit of being able to, use some of that energy to to provide flexibility back to the system at other times so, so as a consumer you don't have to bear the full upfront cost of installing that stuff in your home you're perhaps paying like a monthly fee or an annual fee to a business that's also that's kind of sharing, sharing some of those those differences there have been a few things coming out recently for uh, boiler boiler alternatives and hot water storage which are actually little cloud computing devices uh, which use the which get stuck in your home uh, provide kind of cloud computing off to to some service, and that subsidises the cost of your of your heating and, and, and hot water. So there, there are you know there are there are cleverer ways to think to to think about this and how we can how we can help people you know save on those upfront costs. I've always thought that um, the you know, energy as a service is, and or or any of that you know all all products as services is such a beautiful idea and entirely in line with the circular economy and regenerative design uh, there are however very few actual examples of it being implemented so you know the famous one is shiphole where where philips are providing light levels not the light you know the light fittings are owned by shiphole uh, Shippol don't own any of the infrastructure and so, and so on. They just pay, pay Philips a charge for the light. 
and it's then therefore up to Philips to innovate to save costs and make greater profit through or or, or improve the pricing model. But it it's 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 very difficult to turn that into reality, isn't it? Do you think that? I mean, how, I mean, it would be so brilliant if we could do that. What what, what chances? I think it. I think it's. I think it, it. I think we're. I think we're at a point where that's going to start to shift. I think one of right. one of the barriers. So, for example, something like heat as a service. You want to guarantee that somebody's going to be at a particular temperature. You have to know a lot about the technology in the home, the thermal efficiency of that home. So many things. I think it's. It's. You know, when, when we were trialling that stuff at the Catapult, it was. It was really. It was. It was a bit too early. Um, it was too difficult. Too. Co too. Too expensive to try to do all of those calculations to so that not just the customer knows what that fixed price is, but also the company that's providing that knows that they can make a profit on it. Um, what we're starting to see now with sort of increasing, increasingly people putting storage in the homes, having cars that can provide energy back to the grid through, you know, vehicle, vehicle to grid or kind of back to the home, vehicle to home, is as we start to see more and more of this kind of smart energy management technology in home, I think we're going to start to see more of those kinds of, more of those kinds of business models because there's a there's a lever there for companies to provide you with something which can then provide some flexibility back to the grid. They can aggregate that across a load of different customers. They'll have something that's worth trading. So I think I think that's perhaps a little bit more. I'd expect to see more of that in in the next few yeah, years. But, Eating but, would be nice, but I'll probably add to that. I, I think that already exists in energy as a service in a B two B context. I.e., selling if you're an energy company providing yeah. a service to a consumer. Yeah. Um, that as into a business that's been done quite a lot and proven. Um, obviously, it's probably less of an emotive purchase, more that that's yeah. the best way to yeah. secure my energy costs. It's actually um, but that's an example there. Yes. But of course, what you're selling to the consumer is not really energy; it should be comfort. That's what you're selling. Yeah, it's thermal comfort is the is the is the actual commodity because that's what you are you're seeking. You're not really seeking energy. And if you can have thermal comfort without energy, that'd be brilliant. Uh, there are many uh, questions have come in, and I think I would love, uh, jean claude your thoughts on this one, because you mentioned about a lot of innovation happening and for all these to come together at scale. And the question was, who or what organizations do you think has the responsibility of rallying all these innovations together to create a solution on the scale that we need? So obviously the subtext here is, is that the design council uh, in an expanded role or not? Or is there somebody else, jean claude so it's a fantastic question um, uh, and I'd say the, the Design Council definitely, definitely has a role to play in this for sure. Um, you, we're seeing pockets of, of brilliance and examples of these kind of coalitions forming and of course the, the important thing to mention is that the, the businesses that are participating, it's also public-private partnerships, Everybody needs to, um, they're entering it, doing the right thing for to be human positive and planet positive, but it needs to be business positive as well, otherwise it will lose traction. So uh, I'll give one, I'll give one example that's actually about water, but it's about the water energy nexus and responsible consumption. And that's the 50 litre homes um, uh, coalition or consortium. And that's that's comprising Procter & Gamble, IKEA, Scottish Water, Angie. Unlikely partnerships are coming together. And the whole idea effectively is how can they as organisations help homes reduce the amount of water they use, but as a result, they also reduce the amount of energy that they're using. And I'll give one really simple example. Um, you know, how do you educate the homeowner in an energy crisis that buying a really, really cheap, for example, a dishwasher tablet, um, which means that you have to run your dishwasher three times to get your dishes clean, thereby using much more water and much more energy is actually a false, a false economy. So it's it's educating people about how products and water and waste and energy all go together and how that can be, how a, somebody at home can make an impact and actually all understand consumption. So in summary, Design Council pulling together these complex systems of systems and designing for us as consumers or us as people with human in mind is absolutely critical. Fantastic. Another question I think, um, well, for all of you, but maybe um, uh, Claire and, and Will, uh, because you've talked quite a lot about consumers. Uh, is it actually necessary that consumers understand the science and the complexity of clean energy? 
and the technologies available to be able to make informed decisions uh, and the right choices. Um, so my own hunch is that no, you don't need to know what's under the bonnet. You just need to know how to make the decisions. But what what is the role of of actually spreading greater literacy and numeracy on on these issues? Uh, maybe well, I, I can start. I can start with that one. I'm sure Will's gonna or Will's gonna have some some, some great insights on this. Um, I think the it's it's really interesting. I don't think people should have to understand it. I don't think it's realistic to expect everybody to understand it. Um, we need to design a system that means people don't have to don't have to be worrying about where it where it's coming from and how to use it. That said, what you find uh, when you see um, what we've what we've seen over the last sort of three years, particularly uh, particularly EVs, because that's been the kind of that's the sort of mass low carbon technology that, that that's, that's that's kind of taking off. Um, is is people become much more aware uh, as an EV owner? They start to be more. They, they go from sort of not knowing what a kilowatt hour is. You know, it used to be we would say to people, like, well, "Why do you tell me? Why do you tell me in my bill about kilowatt hours? I don't want you know. I don't want to know about this." To having a sense that at least this thing is. It, is a, they might not be able to explain it to you technically, but they know that this thing is a unit. We've got a dashboard in the car that tells them that, that you know they're getting like four miles per kilowatt hour or whatever. And it becomes the sort of the drop-in equivalent for like a, a sort of a gallon of petrol or something. So, and then you start to get this awareness that actually, because there are options for paying different prices for your charging at different times of day out there, and they start to become a little bit more aware of, of, of what's happening with the, the system and balancing supply and demand. So I think we do, as people adopt some of these technologies, they do become, they do tend to become a little bit more, a little bit more savvy, but we shouldn't be expecting everyone to, to have to do that. Yeah, I completely agree. I was going to say, I was just going to say, yeah, you're going to completely agree. Go for it, yeah, completely, completely agree. I, I feel um, having spent uh, pretty much all my career in energy, uh, energy is very good at designing for energy people um, that understand it and they're engineers. And the challenge is most people aren't that. And you know, how do you make things simple for people to understand and use different concepts to make that clear? A like great analogy of like you know filling the car up, or even you know talking about energy saving and total carbon saving. Or if you just talk about grams of CO2, no one really knows what that means, right? How do you make that um, very, like, what's the equivalent of that? Is that driving somewhere in a car? Um, what energy supplier? I think they did dinosaurs. Claire knows that. Um, in terms of the energy saving piece it, 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 of what that would be. But right. fundamentally making ways to make it accessible. The same with kilowatt hours. There are still energy companies, as an example, um, where they've just got usage graphs in their app, which is just kilowatt hours and meters cubed. Right. What does that mean to someone that doesn't understand energy? I, you pro I probably couldn't tell you exactly how much it is, and I've spent far too long in energy, right? So how do you make that simple so they can understand and start to take action? I think, yeah. and I think it's, it's a great, great point. When you have, um, we see engagement levels across all clients in Europe where you have something that's high energy intensive in the home. That's a, like a, it could be a heat pump or electricity intensive. Let's use that as a better example. Um, a heat pump, an EV, PV customers spend so much more time looking uh, at different things within that so it almost that's the catalyst for them to think a bit more but to get them to that point it has to be simple so it's not 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 dumbing down but just making it easy to understand because people don't have the time to but, but i guess we should, spend. we should we should be aware they're consumers and consumers you know uh because actually the expert consumer is a familiar feature you know when you buy a hi-fi in the old days hi-fi system uh, or, or modern days computer systems, people become incredibly knowledgeable about uh, about wow and flutter in the old days and, and, and decibels and, and so on, and now about megabits per second of, of download speed and things like that. So, so it's 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 got to be a mix mix of those things, surely. Um, I would have thought. Now we we got a few more questions. We only got seven minutes left, so let's try to crack some of these. And I think it's a very interesting issue about waste, effectively, about the waste of energy and uh, what is the role of design, I guess, in, or design or policy? And let's 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 expand the definition of design to go way beyond the design of things to actually design of policies and design of organizations. Um, so this is, of course, a very partisan view here from this uh, questioner. Uh, unnecessary industries like fast fashion and e-commerce, uh, you know, is it is it actually at all practical or feasible to uh, discourage or have tax incentives or something like that? Question really for John Quill first. Um, any thoughts about curbing the waste of energy that certain habits of 
modern civilization might encourage. So I think we're starting to, well, it's interesting. It's a, it's a brilliant question and it goes back to the point uh, that we, we're all making that it's not just about net zero or decarbonisation, it's how all of these things are linked together. We're starting to see um, uh, policy change. So it's it's moving from frameworks and suggestions to standards. We're seeing like uh, TCFD reporting being mandatory for companies over 500 employees in, for the UK government. We're starting to see UK plastic tax um, come in and the EU plastic tax in this year as well. And these, of course, plastic is heavily dependent on the fossil fuel, and fuel industry um, because of how it's made. And so we're starting to see the, the root cause or the root cost that's, that's making a massive difference and in input into production that's going to start to curb these behaviours. Um, and so there's different angles that are happening. It's not perhaps happening yeah. fast enough, but I do think it's moving forward. Very interesting. So the role of ESG and, and such, uh, such things in, in playing that role. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a question here about uh, upfront investment and how difficult it is. I think Will has comprehensively uh, and, and Claire have, have, have nailed that one. Um, interesting idea here. Uh, you know, everybody understands eating your five a day or seven a day as it, it, it has become. Is there an equivalent uh, catchphrase for energy that might that might um, have traction? There's, there's one UK retailer that deals primarily with so, uh, with pay as you go to so prepayment customers. I think they had an energy high five campaign, which was like right. five things. Um, so probably aligning to kind of the five a day. Um, and I think Optus Energy had some good advice around boiler like flow temperatures, um, which have, can have an impact. But I, I think actually that would be quite good. I think the danger with it in energy, if you've made those changes once, like what comes next? So I've done my five, I've solved it. It's not like, because let's say you do the boiler temperature, you've made the change on your flow rates, um, you've made the saving, well, what's next? It's not like you do that every day. So it's, I guess there's a difference between what are repeated behavioral actions uh, and what are kind of a one-off action that has a bigger impact um, and thinking around in that terms as well because some things are one and I've done the, I've made the saving what do I do next thank you and uh, we have very few minutes left and I would like each one of you to do the following if you could which is name one obstacle that you would love to remove at a stroke you know the room 101 type of thing and uh, the other thing is what is the most exciting uh, solution or prospect or innovation that you are aware of right now um, in any order shall we actually just start with uh, Claire okay um so I think one of the on a UK level one of the obstacles I would love to remove is um, and this is this 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 may be a thing that this may be uh, close to your heart is is the inefficiency of our housing stock mm -hmm. um I, I live in a Victorian house, it's in a conservation area that sounds very nice, but you know, it's very actually very difficult to bring that up to a point where it's going to, you know, to bring it up to, to the kind of, I wish I hadn't bought it now, um, it's very difficult to bring it up to, to the, the level of energy efficiency required to really get the most out, out of a heat pump. And you know this is this is not an you know there are there are thousands and thousands and thousands of these houses and, and worse around the UK we've got, you know, we love to put a heat pump in everybody's home, but but the, the reality is at the moment there's there's a lot of work to do to to get many of those homes heat pump ready, um, and I think you know that and the cost of of, of and, the, and, I'd love to I'd love to get those and a solution and a solution. and a solution I I don't have a UK I don't have a UK solution uh, there is a uh, an organisation in the US and I was going to dig out my slides to, to find the name of it again I will I will dig this out and put it in the chat um, and what and their focus is on easy access to low carbon technologies for social help for social housing and for low income uh, privately okay. owned low, low income housing and I'll, I'll tweet that i'll tweet the name in the I'll, I'll put the name in the chat well one obstacle quickly and one solution um i think it's probably i'm sure other people might say the same thing but i guess it's just easy access to data and the quality of data right. um if i look at the uk as an example with a smart meter rollout um, it's pretty much a mess in terms of the, the consistency you get. So we have a client in Belgium, we get pretty much 100% sure. data through. UK, okay. not that, needs and to be better because that's the foundation. Yeah. Um, I, I think the solution, 
uh, if I think back to my, my framing point at the start, it's getting more people there. I think it's um, like innovative business models, bringing finance and energy okay. together to make things accessible because that's how we get more people to participate. And, and you see them on the horizon. That's the key thing. Yeah. So that's lovely. Yeah. Um, and finally, John Quill. So I would love a magic wand uh, to say that we could uh, public private partnerships, I think is critical in all of this. So stop having a myopic view. And I think the solution to that is scaled up financing married against scaled up innovation, as I mentioned earlier. Wonderful. Thank you so much, everyone. I'm hoping that the reason we haven't mentioned retrofit, which is, of course, the, the, the big thing, is that we all assume that a big retrofit program will be one of the biggest uh, things to not only alleviate uh, the carbon em emergency a little bit, but also fuel poverty and to create jobs and all of that bleeding obvious stuff that so many people have been saying for so long. And the obstacle in this case is frankly, uh, government with a big and small G. Uh, but uh, we will uh, can only do so much out of design on that. Thank you all very much for taking part in a really uh, energizing and informative session. Uh, thank you everybody for your questions and have a great rest of the afternoon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. An energizing and informative session indeed. Thank you for that, Sanand, Will, John Quill and Claire. Uh, we'll now break for lunch in this room, but if you want to keep going over in room one, there's a great lunchtime session on sustainable fashion with Sarah Vaughan, Phoebe English and Zinnia Kumar. I think that's going to be really interesting and exciting. Okay, see you all back here at 2 p.m. for a contribution from Lord Devon, the chairman of the Independent Committee on Climate Change and much more.